Would you pray with me? Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for the privilege of being here as a gathered family to worship Jesus Christ, the one whom we've just sung about. Father, we lift up our hands and our heart before him. We ask that you would fill us with your presence this morning. God, use your Holy Spirit to speak to us, to be able to teach us anew from your word, the things that you want us to hear and the things that you want us to do. God, we're grateful for our morning of worship. May we never, ever take it for granted as just, just one more Sunday. Father, we are in the presence of the living, resurrected Jesus Christ. We are privileged this morning to be in his presence, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, good morning. How is everyone today? Good. Good. We're going to be picking back up in the Gospel of John here in just a second, but there are a couple housekeeping things that I want to talk to you about. First uh, and foremost, we have another movie night coming up, and it's going to be December 2nd out here on the lawn and out there on the table. As usual, we have these invitations for you to be able to go out into our community and ask people to join us. So I pray that you will do that. We are planning on showing Despicable Me 3 um, this time, and also, um, I think, a, a Charlie Brown Christmas as well. So we're looking forward to doing that um, on our lawn on December 2nd. The flyers are out there. Uh, you can join us. We are also going to have on the following Sunday, a, or Saturday, a uh, volunteer appreciation, uh, and that's on a Sunday, by the way. Yes, thank you. It's on a Sunday, the volunteer appreciation. So if you're a volunteer in our church, we are certainly inviting you to come to that uh, we're going to love on you for a little bit and say thank you for serving here at Oasis Church. You're an important part of what we do here. Matter of fact, we couldn't do it without our volunteers, without the children's ministry, without the youth ministry, the office people, people who clean, all those different things, the things that you don't see um, that take place on an every week basis. And so we want to say thank you to every one of those who um, serve here and volunteer here. Uh, if you have any questions on that, Miriam is your point of contact. Now, two years ago, we started this gospel, and um, we have gone through, believe it or not, if you're new to Oasis Church, I'm Pastor Bob, I'm the lead pastor here, and we started this journey about two years ago looking at every chapter um, and pretty much every verse in this gospel, asking ourselves three main questions. What does the passage say? What does it mean for us? And, and how do we use what was written so many years ago in our everyday life? And for about 48 messages now, we've been able to do that. And we're excited that we're coming to what I would call the climax of this book. For two weeks or three weeks, we've looked at the, the crucifixion of Christ and the burial of Christ. And, and right now, if you've been kind of with us the last three weeks, every message I kind of end saying the best is yet to come. And today um, is the best, okay? We're going to be looking at the resurrection of Christ. And to kind of get us in the mood, I want you to watch this video that we so if you have your Bible, go ahead and turn with me to John chapter 20. Where we're going to be looking at the first 18 verses of what I call the most important verses in the Bible. Usually verses that we would look on on Easter Sunday. And, and my wife made me wear my Easter Sunday shirt, okay? <laughs> because we're talking about the Easter message. And what's interesting about this is every Easter Sunday morning, usually when we're meeting at Crane Junior High, I say things like this. Easter Sunday is a Sunday that we as believers can celebrate every single Sunday. You don't have to wait, okay, until Easter Sunday to talk about the resurrection to, or to have joy about what took place on that first Sunday, that new Sunday that Jesus came back from the dead. Now, if you've not been here, obviously we have looked at the life of Jesus, all the things that he did in the Gospel of John accumulating with the death of Christ on Good Friday. And, and, and we've kind of, we've, we've talked about this a little bit, and we, we, we tried to put ourselves into the shoes of the people that were there at the crucifixion. The, 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 mother of Mar uh, mother, <laughs> the mother of Jesus, the Marys that were there, the Roman soldiers, all the different people that would have been there to watch him say, it is finished. To have him come off the cross, as Mark talked about last week, and hurriedly put into a tomb so that they could prepare for the Passover. His body not quite prepped the way that it was supposed to have been. And yet, 
Saturday. Can you imagine just for a second what Saturday must have been like for the followers of Jesus? It's hard for us to fathom. It's hard for us to understand that the person who had been walking on this earth for the last three years, proclaiming that he was the Son of God, that his kingdom was at hand, that he was going to establish his rule, was dead. He was in a tomb, and they had put him there, and with all that he had said, they were still thinking the worst. They were thinking that it was all over. They were going to have to go back to being fishermen and tax collectors, and they were going to have to go back to their old jobs, and, and they were going to have to face the crowd. They were going to have to look at the people and say, yeah, the person, we were he was a fraud because he was dead. And you know what's interesting also is these disciples, they, they had reason to be concerned. They had just crucified the leader, and, and people knew the disciples. They, they, they knew them to be followers of him. And more than likely, if the religious leaders could find them, they too would be found on a cross very shortly. They, matter of fact, we'll find out next week, they were fearful of that. They were fearful that they might be arrested and, and crucified. And so Saturday's a mess for the disciples. All the different emotions that must be taking place, they're fearful of their life, they're disappointed, they're discouraged, all these different things. There are a couple people that are pretty excited about this, though. The religious leaders, yep, they're on their high horse right now. We got rid of Jesus. He's no longer going to be a threat to us anymore. The Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Sanhedrin, they wouldn't have to worry about Jesus anymore. Satan's got to be feeling pretty good about this whole thing called the crucifixion. Remember, he's not omniscient. He's not all-powerful. He's thinking, look, he's dead in the ground. He's got to be feeling pretty comfortable about where Jesus is at this very moment. And then comes Sunday morning. Titled it, Joy Comes in the Morning. So if you have your Bibles, why don't you turn with me, and we're just going to start reading and talking, and then there's going to be three questions I want to ask you at the end, all right? So here we go. It says, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene, and we probably remember from a couple weeks ago, Mary Magdalene is that Mary who was possessed by seven demons, and Jesus cast out those demons and radically changed her life. Mary Magdalene is the same Mary Magdalene that was at the cross of Jesus when he was crucified, and she has a lot invested in him, and, and, and her life is devastated. The one who changed her life, the one who ridded her of the chains of bondage, is now dead in a tomb. And she's going to be the first one, along with some other Marys, that are going to come to the tomb early on that Sunday morning. Now, what's interesting about this passage that I like is all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all record the resurrection. The, the four Gospels don't always record every event of the life of Jesus, but they made sure, both Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that they all covered the resurrection because they wanted us, the readers, really, they wanted us, the readers, to understand that Jesus had been resurrected from the dead. So Mary Magdalene, the first one coming to the tomb, and it, while it was still dark, and she saw the stone already taken away from the tomb. Now, I've said this all along. Mary Magdalene does not understand who Jesus is at this point. Mary Magdalene is coming to the tomb to prepare the body of Jesus properly. Mark said last week that Jesus died on a, a Friday. Remembering that the Sabbath begins at 6 p.m. on Friday, they did not have a lot of time to prepare the body. So Mary Magdalene and the other Marys were bringing other spices, and they were going to wrap the body of Jesus properly um, in order for his burial. But when she gets there, she gets a surprise. The first thing that she notices is that the stone is taken away from the tomb. And this is her response in verse 2. She says, And so she ran out and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and we know that to be the gospel writer John, and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. This is why we can say Mary Magdalene wasn't expecting a resurrection. She was not expecting Jesus to be risen from the dead. She thought, again, that someone had stolen the body of Christ. And that was what was rumored to what was going to happen. Because if the zealots could get the body of Christ, they could cause a lot of disruption in Jerusalem. 
And that's why the religious leaders went to Pontius Pilate and said, hey, could you put a guard? Um, could you roll a stone? Could you seal it with the Roman M, you know, the symbol of Rome that anybody would mess with this tomb, they would die. And so all of that had taken place. And so when Mary got to the tomb, she was in for a shock. First of all, that huge stone that covered the grave had been rolled away. And her response is to go and tell Peter and John. It says, now Peter and the other disciple went forth and they were going to the tomb. The two were running together and the other disciple ran faster than Peter and came to the tomb first. Stooping and looking in, he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. Now, you ready for your very first huge theological point of the morning? Here it comes, okay? This is, I mean, you can write... You can write this down, okay? You can share this with people um, at lunch today, and you will impress them to death. You can go to school um, tomorrow um, and, and tell all your friends, and they'll be amazed. Here's the deep theological point of the day. John is faster than Peter, okay? That's what it says, right? Okay, maybe not, all right? Anyway, Peter and John head to the tomb. And they're going to investigate what Mary Magdalene has said. And when they get there, it says that Peter um, and John saw. And I, I, it's, it's tough because we only have really kind of one word for saw. But in the Greek, there's actually three different words um, for the word saw. And the first one happens in here in verse 5. It says, in stooping and looking in, John saw the linen wrappings lying there, but he did not go in. What this word means in the Greek, it was a mere glance, okay? You, don't, you know what I mean, right? When you kind of see something, but you don't really see it. That's what happens to John here. He, he looks in, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, but it didn't, it didn't take hold, okay? So here, let's go on. It says, and so Simon Peter also came, following him, and entered the tomb, and he saw the linen wrappings lying there, and the face cloth which had been on his head, not lying with the linen wrappings, but rolled up in a place by itself. Peter, when you see him looking in and he saw, this means that he looked in and he took careful note, okay? He took note of what was going on and, and he makes the observation. The, the, the wrappings of Jesus were still where they were supposed to be and, and the face napkin had been taken away, and it was separate of the, uh, of the, of the other um, grave clothes. And, and this might not mean a lot to you, but let's think about this for a second. If I was coming in to steal the body of Christ, because that's what a lot of people think. A lot of people still don't believe in the resurrection of Christ. They, they think something happened, uh, and one of the plausible things is somebody did. They came in, and they removed the body of Christ. Now, I don't know about you, I'm not into moving dead bodies a lot, but if I had to move a dead body, I certainly wouldn't unwrap it. Okay, I would, I would pick it up and I would move it away. But in this case, Jesus, the wrappings that were around Jesus were still there. And, and the face cloth had been like if someone had picked it up and moved it aside. And, and when Peter goes and he looks, this is what he takes notice of. And so it says in verse 8 that the other disciple who had first come to the tomb then also entered, and he saw and believed. Now this third saw, when John saw this, it means he saw with understanding. And whatever's taking place right now for the gospel writer John is he's beginning to be able to put things together. Now I've said this, all the way from John chapter 1 when we started this, these disciples are not followers of Jesus because they believe him to be the Messiah. They're not there yet. They're, they're following him because he's asked them to follow. They're following because th there's something different about him, but they don't understand him to be the Son of God yet. John is on the edge. John is beginning to be able to place the things that Jesus said. I'm going to go away. I'm going to die, and I'm going to resurrect myself, and I'm going to go into heaven. John is starting to understand these things, that he must rise again from the dead. It's interesting that this, this whole concept of, uh, of seeing and believing is very much true today. 
See, they're seeing the evidence. They're seeing grave clothes. They're seeing um, that was somebody that was once there is no longer there. They're seeing all these things that are pointing that Jesus is not here anymore. And they're beginning to believe. It's interesting. Even in our culture today, people always want us to prove that Jesus exists. I, 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 I don't know about you, but I get I read a lot of different blogs, and I read lots of different articles, and, and, and people are always argumented, well, if you can prove to me that Jesus exists, then I'll believe. And, you know, that's a very common argument today. Matter of fact, if you were to be in college or if you were to be um, a younger person today, that's, the, that's what, a, again, is being taught. If you, can, if you can prove to me, then I'll believe it. In our day and age, look at what happened after the resurrection of Christ. Let's look at just some proof that happened after. Look, the whole world changed based on the resurrection of Christ. Based on our calendaring system. Based on, by the way, have you ever asked yourself why you're here this morning? How did you get here? For the great many of us that are here today, it's because that at one point in our life, we acknowledged that we needed a savior. We need we needed someone to save us of our sin and to come into our heart and our life. You're here based on what? The resurrection of Jesus Christ. The changed life you represent is proof. But see, people want that 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 proof that they can touch. The proof that they can see with their own eyes. Well, I, I got to tell you, you got to come back next week when we talk about doubting Thomas, and we'll, we'll get to that. But look, the proof exists within us. You're the proof. I'm the proof of the resurrection. And notice their response. Now, if this isn't one of those weird verses in the Bible that I just, you know. And so they find out that Jesus is not there. And what's their response? So the disciples went again to their own homes. That's not exactly, okay, uh, what I would have done with that information. Now, let me go to my home now. And, uh, and by the way, can I just say this? If I was Jesus, I would have done this whole resurrection thing differently. <laughs> yeah, I've been told that. <laughs> I have been told that over and over. But look, when, if, if I had been Jesus... I wouldn't have resurrected to, you know, here in, 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 to Mary Magdalene here in just a second. I, I would have resurrected right on the main street of Jerusalem. Okay? I, I mean, I would have popped up, aha, see, you crucified me. Now I'm right here. What do you got to say about that? No, actually, if I had been Jesus, I probably wouldn't have done that. I would have resurrected right at the religious leader's home. I would have, okay. How, okay, maybe, maybe, not, maybe not the religious thing. How about Pontius Pilate? Hey, just came back to show you, you really are that spineless wimp that we all think that you are, okay. <laughs> you know, you, I think that we'll go with the original statement. It's a good thing that I'm not Jesus, okay. <laughs> Let's look at who Jesus does appear to. The disciples go home. It says, but Mary was standing outside the tomb weeping. And so as she wept, she stooped and looked into the tomb. And she saw two angels in while sitting, one at the head and one at the feet, where the body of Jesus had been lying. And they said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Are you getting her frame of mind? Are you getting the absolute devastation that she's feeling at this very moment? John and Peter, it they, they appears that they've gone back to their home, and Mary's standing outside the tomb, and, and she's now, remember, Mary has been possessed by seven demons, and she's now going to have a personal encounter of two angels, okay, talking about going from one extreme to the other, and as she's there weeping in her devastation, in her despair, all she wants to do, all really is that on her mind is to get the body of Jesus back so that they can properly bury it. That's what's on her mind. Let me find, where, where, did, where did you take him? Where did you put him? I'll bring him back myself, but we got to get him buried in, 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 in according to our custom. And the angels, woman, why are you weeping? He said, because they have taken away my Lord, 
I do not know where he is. I hope that you can see the frame that Mary is in. And as it kind of goes on, it says that when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing here. Same word for mere glance again. She glanced and, and saw a mere presence of Jesus. And, and Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? And whom are you seeking? And supposing him to be the gardener, see, she, she still doesn't understand. She said to him, sir... If you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Have you ever been in a position in your life where just you're hurting so bad that nothing makes sense? Some of you have told me your stories. I, there's been a few times in my own life, when I mean when the pain is so intense and it's so hard um, that, that nothing makes sense to you. This is where Mary's at. This is her life right now. Everything that she knew, um, again, the guy that changed her life is gone, and, and everything, that, everything with that has been destroyed, and, and, and she's crushed. And I love this, what it says. It says, Jesus said to her, Mary. Maybe she didn't see with her own eyes, but when she heard the voice, she turned and she said to him in Hebrew, Rabboni, which means teacher. She recognized the voice of Jesus. And isn't it funny that, that the Bible, if we go back in the Gospel of John, it says that the sheep will what? Know my voice. And in her pain and in her discomfort, she hears the voice of Jesus. And Jesus said to her, stop clinging to me. <laughs> what do you think she did, by the way? You know, um, Monty and Kathy, you'll appreciate this because I know that you were at least in that part of the country um, where I came from a long time ago in the South, okay? And, and they had these weird phrases in the South. I don't know, um, you know, we just don't use them out here on the West Coast. Um, they, uh, um, hug your neck, okay? You, you heard that? You hug your neck, okay? And, and this is exactly what Jesus, or Mary was doing to Jesus. I would be. I don't know about you, but if my life was absolutely turned upside down, then all of a sudden the person who was dead on Friday was alive on Sunday, I might have a tendency to want to grab on and never let go. Stop clinging to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I ascend to my Father and your Father and my God and your God. And Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he has said these things to her. Now, I don't know whether you grew up um, with stuffed animals or not, but um, for some people, stuffed animals bring a lot of comfort, okay? And um, our family, it was no exception. Our, our, our daughter had a stuffed animal, and... Um, uh, my wife has stuffed animals, and they, they bring comfort. And I'm going to tell you something. You see some kids when they're walking around clinging to their stuffed animal. I mean, and if you, tr what happens when you try to take the stuffed animal away? Moms and dads. Yeah, you know it, okay? You've got World War III about to take place a a a because it brings them comfort. Well, when Mary saw Jesus, she probably wrapped her arms around him so tight. And matter of fact, if she had her way, probably, she was not going to let go of Jesus forever. Wherever he goes, I'm going to go. Whatever he tells, I, I'm right here. I've got him. And there's no better place to be. There is no better place to be than hugging, clinging on, not let going. I'm not sure that that's correct English. <laughs> Nobody ever said I was smart, okay? <laughs> not letting go of your Savior. But doesn't he have an interesting response to her? Stop clinging to me. Do you think that he minded the attention? I don't think he did either. He had a plan for her. He had a purpose 
for her. What was her job? Her job was to go and tell the disciples of all the things that she said. And you know what? You know what? She, she had a choice to make because in order for her to go and tell the disciples, what did she have to do? Oh, gosh, how many of you want to let go? See, this is really good. You're not going to like it, but this is really good. There's nothing better than to be in the arms of Jesus. I'm going to tell you something. Once you've experienced Jesus Christ um, as your Savior, as your Lord, as your constant friend, you never want to let go. And you should never, by the way, let go. But let's play this out just a little bit. Some of us would rather cling to Jesus and say, I, I'm, I'm, Jesus, I, we're, I, I've got you right here, and I'm not going to let you go. And you're missing the very thing that he told you to go out and do, which is tell others about Jesus. Oh, no, Lord, I can't do that, but I've got you. I've got you, Lord, and I'm not going anywhere except you're missing the very thing that he told us to do was to go out and tell others about himself. Man, that's, that, there, that's, there's actually some merit there to that. There's, a, there's a, some good teaching there if we listen to it. Look, I'm not saying that we have to let go of Jesus. Matter of fact, what I'm saying is wherever you go, take Jesus with you. And, and maybe we should probably clean that up just a little bit. Wherever he leads you, you'll, ha you'll hang on to, and you'll go wherever he tells you to go. And then there's this, there's this thing here that we like to do sometimes, and we like to put Jesus kind of up on a shelf like this, and, you know, God, things are kind of going really great in my life, and, you know, I don't really need you right now. Because I got that promotion. I got what I'm looking for in life. I got everything's just, it's great. I, I, I got my degree. Everything's fine in my life. I met Mr. or Miss Wright, and, and we're planning a family. Everything's going great, except that, you know, sometimes things don't go like you think they're going to go. Ask Mary Magdalene. And then things kind of turn, and things don't go the way you think. And you know what our first response is to do, right? Oh, I need you again, and you carry him around, and you cling to him, and you hold on to him. Look, we were never meant to let go. But we also have to remember, just like he told Mary, go and announce to the disciples. Go and tell the disciples. I'm thinking about this whole thing. Didn't he also tell us somewhere in his word that we were to go and tell the people that live around us? We have people visiting from Canada today. Go tell the people that live around you that Jesus is what? Alive. You want proof? I'm the proof. You're the proof. My life has been radically transformed, changed because of Jesus' presence in me. Man, if Jesus' resurrection is the greatest thing that ever happened, and in Bob's opinion, in all of history, now there's been some pretty cool things that have happened in history. And if Jesus is the greatest thing that's ever happened in history, because let's face it, somebody that was once dead, three days later is alive. It didn't happen very much. It doesn't happen very much today. I've done enough memorial services. Usually when they're dead, they stay dead. But Jesus is different. He changed everything. And yet a lot of us, a lot of us, well, Pastor, I, I, don't know how to, I don't know how to tell people about Jesus. Then show them. Show them how much you love Jesus. Minister to them. Love on them. Be like Jesus to them. I love that Mary Magdalene came announcing to the disciples, I have seen the Lord and reported all the things that she had seen. Three questions I got for you this morning. Let me put... Yeah, well, whoever. 
All right. Three questions I want to ask you this morning. Why are you weeping? You say, I'm not weeping, Pastor. I'm in a good mood today. What's got you down? What has you discouraged this morning? I mean, what's not going exactly the way you would like it to go? What really are you struggling with this morning? What has you concerned? Matter of fact, we could probably just kind of open up the mic and, you know, you could share those things with me. And, and there's lots of issues that are people go. But let me tell you something. Jesus Christ is resurrected. And he's alive. And he lives within believers. And yeah, there are some discouraging things. There are some things that are happening in our world that we can't understand. There are all kinds of different things that are taking place. But it hasn't changed the fact that Jesus is alive. It doesn't change it. And by the way, he's still in control. I love this verse. It says, weeping may last for the night. And I've been there. You've been there. We've all been there. We've had difficult times in our life. Some of us are there today and some of us are not. But let me tell you something. There is joy that comes in the morning. Because of the resurrected Christ. Second question. What are you looking for in life? Who are you looking for in life? Jesus asked Mary, why are you weeping and who are you seeking? Great question for us to ask ourselves this morning. Who are we seeking? What are you seeking for your life right now? We talked about a little bit about it. You know, some of us, well, let's, let's be honest with ourselves. You know, uh, sometimes we're seeking fame. Popularity, fortune, success, promotion, good days. There's all these things that we seek um, on, on a regular basis, but let me, just, let me be honest with you. They're temporal. They're here for a second. They might even be here for a season. They might even last. You might be totally blessed, and they may last your whole life. But if you're seeking the wrong thing today for your contentment, for your peace, for your, for your salvation, if you're looking for all the wrong things, I'm going to tell you something. There's only one right answer. And it's the resurrected Christ. It's Jesus. So who are you seeking in your life? What are you seeking in your life? And, and that's such a hard question. You know, I'm not unrealistic because I know, um, you know, I wasn't a pastor all the days of my life. I understand that there's lots of priorities and there's lots of things in our life. And, and sometimes, sometimes we get them out of whack. And if we're not careful, you start a tailspin by seeking all the wrong things, the things that you think are going to bring you happiness and joy without seeking the one who can and will bring you joy. I've had people say, Pastor, how does that work? Okay, I'm here today, and I, I'm not sure really what I need to do. What's my next step? You need to ask Jesus to speak to your heart. That's where it starts. Lord, I'm not sure about Jesus. I'm not sure about this resurrection. Did you really rise from the dead? The funny thing about God is when you ask him questions like that, he reveals himself to you. He doesn't want it to be a secret. He's, going, he's not up there saying, no, if they ask, I'm not going to tell. Ask God. Lord, I'm confused today. I'm not sure. Did you really rise from the dead? Really, are you who you said you are? Are you the Son of God? Are you the Savior? Are you the one that can forgive me of my sins? Are you the one that I can find eternal life in? If you're not sure, ask him. What a great place to start. Last question. Will you go? Stop clinging to me and go and tell my disciples.
will you go? See, everything that we do here, and I pray that we try to do here, is to connect people into a relationship with Jesus Christ on their time schedule and God's time schedule. But it takes people like you and I to go out and to be able to invite. It takes people like you and I to go out and to be able to share who Jesus is in our life. And, and, and please, you know, don't listen to the, the people, well, I don't know how. Philip, you don't have to have any formal education. You, all you have to do is, what did Jesus do in your life? What did Jesus do in your life? Will you go? Look what it says in the Gospel of Mark. It says, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel, preach the good news, preach what we've talked about the last four weeks, the death, the burial, and the resurrection. Tell them about Jesus. Preach the word. Be ready in season. Be and out of season. Use God's word to reprove, to rebuke, to exhort, and be patient. Be patient and allow God to work. I don't want to get started on that, but let's be patient because a lot of times in the church, we think that we ought to change people and they ought to conform to what we think. And the funny thing is the only person that can change anybody is the Lord Jesus. And, and we, we don't want to let him do that. We want to do it for him, and we can't. So will you go? 